When I was six years old, my family decided that it was time for us to move from Cambridge, Massachusetts, 36 miles north to Haverhill, Massachusetts. Things got a little too expensive for us in Cambridge. And we moved up to Haverhill because we had some family there already. There was an opportunity for um, a job for my, my family. And I cried my entire way all the way up the highway. I didn't want to leave the city. I loved the lights. I loved riding my bikes in Cambridge and in Boston late at night, seeing all the buzz, the activity, everything that was happening, and moving instead to a smaller sized city, a more humble city. And so growing up in Haverhill, my entire dream was to make it back to the city, the city, quote unquote, Boston, Cambridge, or DC, New York, Chicago, where it was happening. And so my dream was to work hard. I went to Haverhill High School. I graduated there, came back to BU, or came to BU, and I fulfilled, quote unquote, that dream by living in the city and having not the ideal apartment I wanted next to Fenway Park, but a South Campus dorm, which was pretty good. <laughs> and so I want to talk to you guys about a decision that I made when I graduated from BU, which was to ditch all of that stuff and instead come back home to Haverhill and why millennials should consider doing something similar, either coming to their prospect city or considering moving to a prospect city they have yet to discover. And so we'll start by talking a little bit about millennials and the misconceptions and the myths that people tell about us. After all, we're the most researched generation ever. We've been told we're lazy, we're the selfie generation, that we love to just be on our computers all the time, that we're not sociable. And I don't have to tell this room that those are all myths. But corporate America has dumped a lot of money into researching patterns and traits about millennials. And they deduce all types of information about our buying patterns, our characteristics. And they come up with these crazy assertions like millennials don't like buying cars. They, they love Uber and they love Lyft and they love riding public transit all the time. They're such hipsters and yuppies. That we're afraid of commitment. That we've been penetrated by the college hookup culture. Shout out to my fiance. She's trying on her wedding dress in New York right now. Hi, babe. And that we like living in 300 square foot apartments that are full of exposed brick and very tiny kitchens. But what's really at play? Do we really, is this really the truth? If we zoom out and take a look at the greatest force affecting millennial decision making and characteristics, it's the economy, stupid. And you might say, well, Andy, Andy, the economy is affecting everybody, whether it's millennials or seniors or boomers. The reality is, is that it's not affecting everybody equally. Millennials are the first generation to be worse off than our parents. On average, adjusted for inflation, we make 20% less than our parents did at the same age, despite having a higher level of educational attainment. And on top of that, tuition has tripled over the course of the last 20 years, and the average student loan debt is $30,000. So no wonder we don't like buying cars, because we can't afford them. No wonder we're living in small apartments, because they're cheaper. And maybe we'll delay marriage a little bit longer, because we just can't afford it right now. I want to wait until we're on more solid financial ground. So having this context can tell us a, a better story about millennials, a more authentic story about millennials. So where do prospect cities come in, and why are prospect cities and millennials a great match for each other? And I'll tell you how we came up with the term prospect city. A couple of city leaders and planners uh, and I sat together and we talked about how do we categorize cities like Haverhill? Is it a small city? Is it a medium-sized city? Is it a town? Is it a big city? How many of you guys would say that Boston's a big city? Medium-sized city. How about a town? You must be from Chicago, right? Yeah. My friend from Chicago would categorize Boston as a small town, right? And so when I went around telling people, yeah, I'm from this mid-sized city, you know, Haverhill, they'd say, well, how many people are there? About a million, half a million? What do you got? So now we've got 65,000 people. And so there wasn't really a term to define prospect cities because we weren't rural. We weren't totally suburban. We had an urban core. And so we came up with our own definition for prospect cities. And prospect cities have a couple of key characteristics. The first is they're, they have a population between 40,000 to 150,000 people. So they're not too small to make it feel like you're out 
and farmland, although we do have some farmlands. And they're not too big to make it feel like a huge metropolis. Prospect cities usually are post-industrial cities where manufacturing used to be big and booming and where immigrants came to find jobs and opportunity, just like my parents did. And they're diverse. But perhaps the most important point for millennials is that there's an urban core to prospect cities. There's a downtown. There's a densely populated area. And I'll tell you why that's so important. And there are three basic principles as to why prospect cities are a perfect match for millennials. The first is livability. Again, taking into account that the biggest force affecting millennials is our economic circumstances. The second is opportunity, career opportunity. And the third is the broader impact that we have not only on ourselves as millennials and on prospect cities, but on the country at large. So if we start with livability, prospect cities offer the best of both worlds for millennials. You can have an apartment with exposed brick right along the Merrimack River and pay it for a third of the cost in Boston while still living above a coffee shop while still being a block away from the post office and a hop, skip, and a jump away from the commuter rail. You can do all those things without sacrificing an urban core. You can have a more affordable living without sacrificing that urban hip core that we love. The second is opportunity. You might think, and the misconception is that you've got to go to big cities because that's where the opportunity is. But it's simple supply and demand. It's much more difficult to get a job in a big city because there are more applicants. So if you come to a prospect city, you'll be able to jump into more junior or senior level positions in a, in a sector that you're more passionate about. So you'll be able to jump in and have an impact on your, either your focus of study, whether it's you know, entrepreneurship, running for office like I did, or working for a nonprofit. And you'll be able to move up the ranks into junior and senior level positions earlier on. On top of that, it's much easier to penetrate traditional power structures in prospect cities. Can you walk in and meet with the mayor here in Boston right now? You can't. You can hopefully set up an appointment maybe with a large group of students. In Prospect Cities, you can walk in and have coffee with the mayor once a week. You can meet with the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce and they'll introduce you to every single entrepreneur or business leader in the community that's willing to lend, them, lend you your time, their time to help you launch your business or your nonprofit because they've already invested so much in the community and they're eager to see millennials come and bring their creativity and energy. And the final is impact. And I have a picture here of a friend of mine named Fran Allen Acosta. Fran used to sell solar panels. And at 23 years old, three years old, he left his job, he quit his job, and started a company called Mi Casita. My homes, my little home. And he's building tiny homes in the city of Lawrence, a prospect city. Lawrence wouldn't have been introduced to tiny homes, this concept, without millennial creativity, ingenuity, and energy. A city that struggles with low-income housing now is looking at innovative ways to address that through tiny homes. This is exactly the type of energy that millennials can infuse into prospect cities. And on top of that, we saw in this past election that prospect cities and big cities have some different priorities and circumstances. We saw that prospect cities are screaming for help, that smaller and mid-sized cities in America need more support, need more energy, creativity, ingenuity that this generation can provide. And so in addressing that problem that we saw in the election, we can also make life better in big cities by moving to prospect cities. How can we do that? We can address gentrification. And we're seeing this happen already in a couple of the hottest markets in the country, in New York, Miami and San Francisco, the demand of millennials moving to those cities has actually slowed in the past six years. And so naturally, rent prices are either moderating or they're going down. And so if we shift supply and demand of whether it's our dollars, our creativity, our ingenuity to smaller and mid-sized cities, I think our impact can be tremendous across this country while also providing a great opportunity to launch your careers and jump straight into junior and senior level positions. I'll close with this term. Anyone ever heard of the term FOMO? Yeah. Raise your hand if you know what FOMO is. Okay, great. If you don't know what FOMO is, FOMO means fear of missing out. And I want to tell you about the first time I diagnosed myself with FOMO. I was lucky enough to apply and intern at the White House. They were crazy enough to accept me. 
And on the second to last day of my White, White House internship, the president came in to give some advice to his interns. And somebody raised their hand and said, Mr. President, uh, what's the key to living a fulfilling life? And he said, well, uh, look, <laughs> let me be clear. The key, he said, the key to living a fulfilling life is not thinking about who you want to be. It's what you want to do, right? So it's not, we're, we're constantly told, what do you want to be when you grow up? Is it a doctor, a CEO, a congressman? No, it's what do you want to do with those positions? What are the actions you want to take, right? And so I started thinking about, well, why do I want to stay in D.C.? Why do I want to go to Boston or New York or Chicago? What's, what's it really about? What's driving me there? And that's when I diagnosed myself with FOMO. <laughs> it was the fear of missing out. We're constantly told that this is where it's happening, that big cities are where you need to be. All the buzz and the activity, you've got to be there, you're, miss out. you're missing out. But the reality was is that if I wanted to have a direct impact, if I wanted to work on issues that I cared about, if I focused on what I wanted to do, the answer became more clear. I needed to come back home to Haverhill and stop the brain drain that is happening in prospect cities across this country, or at least contribute to stopping it. And so my message is this. If I was able to come back home to a prospect city instead of moving to a bigger size city, if I was able to run for office at 21 years old and win in my first election to the Haverhill City Council, you can too. And if together we all focus on prospect cities, which outnumber big cities, we can revitalize this country, share prosperity from East Coast to West Coast, and revitalize our entire nation. Thank you.